Let us pray. Father, we ask you to hear our joyful hymn of praise. As we come to this place today, there are some whose hearts are full of thanksgiving. God has been so good. God has blessed us so richly. But Lord, there are others of us that are maybe a bit distant this morning. Feeling like life has taken a difficult turn, like, well, where are you even, God? Are you listening? It's our prayer that whatever station or season of life we find ourselves in this morning, we would find room in our hearts to thank you for who you are. A God of grace, a God of mercy, a God who offers us salvation, a God who offers us life. And while life sometimes is difficult, we know that this life that we live is not lived alone. It's not lived without hope because we know you are with us. Help us to claim that this morning as your people. Help us to find gratitude in our hearts wherever we might be in our lives this day. I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. We turn to Paul's first letter to the Thessalonians this morning. I'm going to be reading from chapter 1, verses 1 through 10. Hear these words. Paul, Silvanus, and Timothy. To the church of the Thessalonians in God the Father and the Lord Jesus Christ, grace to you and peace. We always give thanks to God for all of you and mention you in our prayers constantly remembering before our God and Father your work of faith and labor of love and steadfastness of hope in our Lord Jesus Christ. For we know, brothers and sisters, beloved by God, that He has chosen you because our message of the gospel came to you not in word only, but also in power and in the Holy Spirit and with full conviction. Just as you know what kind of persons we proved to be among you, for your sake. And you became imitators of us and of the Lord, for in spite of persecution, you received the word with joy inspired by the Holy Spirit, so that you became an example to all the believers of Macedonia and Achaia. For the word of the Lord has sounded forth from you, and not only in Macedonia and Achaia, but in every place your faith in God has become known, so that we have no need to speak about it. For the people of those regions report about us what kind of welcome we had among you and how you turned to God from idols to serve a living and true God and to wait for His Son from heaven, whom He raised from the dead, Jesus, who rescues us from the wrath that is coming. This is the Word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. It turns out mom was right. What I'm talking about are all those times she reminded us to say thank you. Maybe you received a gift. Maybe you received a compliment. Maybe someone just did something for you. But if your mom was like my mom, and she was there, she would always say, or in some way make it known, the question, what do you say? What do you say? Now, we all are familiar with this, I think, at some level. It's just what moms do. They remind us of how important it is to be grateful. Some moms just come right out and say it, you know, what do you say? Other moms, it might be a nudge in the side or just a little gentle reminder that you need to say thank you. For my mom, it was the look. <laughs> a look I could feel across a room. If I had not said thank you, I would turn and I would see her looking at me. And I remember any number of times saying, oh yeah, thank you. Because I was getting that look. Whatever message. Whatever message mom chose to use, the point was clear. 
We should make it the first priority of our lives anytime we receive something, anytime we are given something, anytime somebody does something for us to say thank you. Mom was right. Mom was right. Not because it was the protocol of politeness or a mere formality. Saying thank you goes beyond that. It can make a difference in those around us. And yes, it can make a difference in each one of us. This has been proven in the workplace. CEOs, managers, supervisors who thank their employees get better results. It's also found to be so, been found to be so effective that companies have produced, now get this, they've produced an expressions of gratitude list. This is for all those supervisors who are so thank you challenged that they don't know what to say. And so they've been actually given a list to go by. And it includes such things as, you know, your contribution is important. I'm truly grateful. You make my job so easier. But they've had to have classes on how to say thank you. Good practices come out of the practice of saying thank you. Even if solely for strategic reasons. Good things can happen when we say thanks. It's good for the giver. It's good for the receiver. But I can't help but think this morning about Chick-fil-A. Maybe because I always want a Chick-fil-A sandwich on Sunday. Maybe that's why it's on my mind. I have done that before, have you? I've traveled all the way from my house all the way out there just to get that special milkshake they had on sale and got there on Sunday evening and they were closed. And I was so disgusted with that policy. It's a good policy. It's a great policy. But boy, sometimes on Sunday it'd be great to have Chick-fil-A. But what do they say in Chick-fil-A that we hear over and over and over again? My pleasure. It doesn't matter if they give you an extra Chick-fil-A sauce, if they, they come to your table and give you something, if they're giving you that fried sandwich with just a pickle on it that costs five bucks. You know, it just, it, it, it doesn't matter. It's always backed up with the words, my pleasure. And sometimes I want to go, really? Really? Is it your pleasure is it your pleasure to be serving me this extra package of Chick-fil-A sauce? But you hear it over and over and over again. My pleasure. And you begin to wonder how sincere it is. Is it just a part of the, um, well, a package there at Chick-fil-A? Or is it something that they really mean? My pleasure. Thank you. It seems so mechanical sometimes, but you know what? Even in those times when it's mechanical, it seems, or we know they're being told to say that, it still means something to us, doesn't it? I keep going back to Chick-fil-A because I want somebody to be happy with me. And it's their pleasure to serve me. It's so wonderful to hear those words. It's so wonderful to hear thank you, even if it just seems like it's really just coming from almost a, a Stepford Wife kind of mentality. And if you remember Stepford Wives, I really went over your heads there. But it's a great movie if you want to watch it someday. Anyway, it just seems so robotic almost. Almost like it doesn't make any real sense to to be happy, but we are happy when people say nice things. You know, we say, well, you know, that's just very superficial. That's shallow. That's just not right. It's not right to say thank you with an agenda in mind. It's not right just to be saying those things to possibly have some gain later on in the future. But before we're too quick to judge, there are those of us who don't think to say thank you as often as we should. Maybe our mothers didn't nudge us enough, or maybe your mother didn't have the look. If our dutiful, though, even somewhat mechanical efforts to express gratitude gets us saying thank you, there's something to that. The more we say thank you, the more it becomes a part of who we are. It creates a general awareness in our soul and in our spirits of our need to be grateful. The Apostle Paul was grateful for the Thessalonians. He was grateful most of all for the Thessalonian church and the great progress it had made. He thanks them 
at the beginning of his letter. He thanks God for them in the middle of his letter. He thanks them towards the end of the letter. He thanks them a lot in this letter. Because you see, Paul was grateful for the Thessalonians and the fact that they had, had stayed together. It had been a rough start for the church in Thessalonia. Paul had gone there and literally been run out by a mob. They were not accepted there. They, they, they didn't, you know, didn't really get a great start at all because people just were so unsure of who they are and what they were trying to do. They didn't, didn't want the Christian presence in that community. But the Thessalonians stayed strong. They stayed strong in their faith. And even in those hostile surroundings, the church pressed on. The church grew. The people grew even stronger in the depth of their faith. It's growth in an extremely challenging environment that moved Paul to write these words. We always give thanks to God for all of you and mention you in our prayers, constantly remembering before our God and Father your work of faith and labor, of love and steadfastness of hope in our Lord Jesus Christ. Paul acknowledges that it was the faith of the people, grounded in salvation, that offered them the opportunity to grow stronger in their faith. It didn't stop there. It didn't stop with just their faith. Their faith was just the foundation that they, they lived out their lives upon. It, it was the foundation for the way they acted towards each other. It was the foundation for them being able to put up with all the hostilities is the foundation for understanding to have hope about what was to come and hope in the end. They had a strong faith, that faith that endured, that faith that got them through, that faith that helped the church continue to grow, that faith that was lived out in each one of them. You see, Christianity is not about static belief. It's not about just saying, I love you, Lord, and that's it. It's not about coming to church you know, almost routinely week in and week out and saying, I've done my job. Christianity is a belief that needs to be lived out in our faith through our words, our actions, our attitudes. People need to be able to see Christ in us. Paul writes to them to thank them for what they've done to make that happen in Thessalonia. How much their faithfulness and their witness mean to Him and for how strong they were, even in the face of adversity, He thanks them. I want to take a moment just to thank you. Thank you for being the church. A church that has a faith that's grounded in love. A church that's grounded in a steadfastness of hope. A church is always looking to do more for the kingdom. It is a blessing to be your pastor. It is a blessing to have Ann with me today in the family. You know, we are kind of a long distance parsonage family, but she hears about you and your wonderful gifts and the wonderful things you do, the way you reach out among the church internally and the way you reach beyond the walls of the church externally to show others the love of Christ. And your faithfulness blesses me. It blesses me. I'm so grateful for those of you as I look in your eyes this morning who do so much under the radar. People who just serve because they love the Lord and they love their church and they want to give their best for Christ. I'm thankful for those of you who, who work in helping hands, for those of you who work in the youth group, for, for Ashley and his wonderful musicianship and the way he's led our choir during this time, for all the musicians who are part of it. We have so much to be grateful for. And I'm grateful that I'm the pastor of a church where I'm in ministry with you. It's not about the pastor doing it all. It's about all of us doing it together. And I feel that strong sense of mission and purpose here in the life of this church. And I want to encourage you by saying thank you. Just as Paul encouraged the Thessalonians, when it's difficult times, when it seems like things may be working against us, stand strong in your faith. Stand strong knowing that we are the people of God and we are the body of Christ and together we can be the church. As Paul thanked the Thessalonians, he thanked them to encourage them to do more, to do better, 
to be, well, to continue to do what they were already doing and living out their life of faith. And I say that to you this morning in the hope, one of the things I try to do is to thank everybody that participates the best I can because it means something to me because you bless me through what you do. And I want to say thank you for that. But how often have we as a church really taken the opportunity to thank those around us for what they do? From the trustees chair to the staff parish relations chair to the finance chair, you know, those, those positions in the church that are so important, but you know, they get bogged down in the business of the church and sometimes it's, it's tedious, it's hard. When's the last time you've reached out to those folks and said thank you for your administrative leadership? To the program committees that we've announced for the new year, those chairs, when's the last time you reached out to them and said thank you for what you do? We as a church need to be a church of gratitude. And in being a church of gratitude, there is nothing, not even Satan himself, that can overcome our church. We will continue to grow. We will continue to be strong, not only as a church, but in our own personal relationships with Jesus Christ. Because the more we are grateful, the more we are grateful for each other, the closer we're going to be in our relationship to Christ and the closer we're going to be in our relationship to others, even in this room today. Say thank you. Say thank you. Encourage each other. And give thanks for each other as the body of Christ. Which points to another side of our being grateful. We do become better people, but our hearts are filled with gratitude. There was a man named John Kralik who discovered this. John Kralik was an attorney, had life going well for him. Everything seemed to be heading in the right direction. Then suddenly his marriage went sour. His business went south. He found himself living in a one-bedroom apartment. His wife was gone. His family was disenfranchised from each other, just really not, not there for each other. His business began to just go to the point where he had no business. He didn't know what to do. And one evening, he says, in that one-bedroom apartment, he was at his lower, lowest point. He heard an inner voice saying, until you learn to be grateful for the things you have, you will not receive the things you want. It changed his life. He realized he needed to be more grateful for the things that he had. And he began every day to write a thank you note. Every day he would write a thank you note to someone. He started with his family. He started with his old, older son and oldest son and wrote a thank you letter to him. And the son immediately got back with him and says, Dad, let's have lunch. And it was during that lunch that the older son reminded him that he owed his dad $4,000 that he loaned him. Make you want to go write a thank you letter to your son? There are a lot of people going to be getting out the pencils and paper this afternoon, I can tell already. But this really happened. The son said, Dad, I owe you some money. I know you've probably forgotten it, but I want to pay that back. So the father immediately wrote another thank you note to his oldest son for paying back that money. But it continued. He, he wrote clients that he'd worked with. He wrote, other, he wrote other law practices that he dealt with that had sent him business. And he began to thank people on a daily basis. And he says his life literally changed. He says, in the act of being thankful, my world began to thrive. My world began to thrive. Crayley ultimately became a superior court judge. He also became author of a book. A book titled 365 Thank Yous. The Year a Simple Act of Daily Gratitude Changed My Life. He said at one point he, he decided to stop writing the notes, but he couldn't do it. He had to keep writing thank yous. He had to keep writing his expressions of gratitude to someone each and every day. The practice of being grateful and saying thank you helps you to look at and approach life from a very different perspective. You know, it's kind of like the donut. I love donuts. I think I've said that before in here, but I, I love donuts. But I've always wondered why they have that hole in the middle. I still haven't quite figured that out because it seems like to me like I'm missing some of the donut. Why'd you leave that out? But you know, that's the way some of us approach our lives. All we, 
Well, we have all these blessings around us. God has given us so much, but all we seem to be focused on is the hole in the donut, the things that we don't have. And that bothers us. It weighs us down. It, it gets us to a point where we, we can't even you know, live life on a, a daily basis with any happiness or joy because we, we feel like we're missing out on so much. Focus on the donut, not the hole. Too many of us focus on the hope. Wondering why God didn't do this, why God didn't do that, while I don't have this, while I don't have that. Pat, I'm not even going to say it. While I... All those things that we wish we had, but we don't have, we just focus on those things. When God in His great goodness, my goodness, even gives us sprinkles. That's wonderful. Look at the donut. Look at the donut. Pay less attention to the hole in the things that you don't have. Mom was right. The Apostle Paul was right. It's good to say thank you. Will we thank others, family members, church members, friends, co-workers, whoever it is that does something for us, we encourage them to keep up the kindness, to keep up the good work, to keep up the faithful witness, to keep up the great job they're doing in the life of the church, for being the good son, for being whatever it is those people need to hear. Thank them for it. And greater things, I believe, are yet to come for you and for them. We become better people. We grow deeper in our relationship with Christ, with others, because our hearts filled with gratitude remind us over and over and over again how blessed we are. Towards the end of Paul's first letter to the Thessalonians, he writes these words. Words that I challenge you during this season of Thanksgiving to live by, not only this week, but all the weeks of the year. In fact, 365 days a year we can be grateful because the Word says, give thanks. Give thanks in all circumstances. For this is the will of God. The will of God for us to be grateful. In Christ Jesus, our Lord. Thanks be to God. Thank you. Thank you for being the church. Let's be the church together. A church that always has a grateful heart for what God is doing, what God is going to do. And grateful for each one of us as we encourage each other in ministry in the days ahead. Amen.